He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven because he was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And by the way, if I were like Arlise or Irma or who else did I say over there on this side, I would be doing very well in the eyes of God. So that was all a joke. I hope you understand that. Pray her down those steps, everybody. Several churches ago, I served a congregation that didn't like Holy Communion a lot. They'd only had it once a quarter when I got there. And I said, we're going to have it once a month. And someone said to me, are you going to force us to take communion once a month? I said, I'm never going to force anybody to take communion, but I'm going to celebrate it once a month. We got from there finally to celebrating it every Sunday. But before that happened, Palm Sunday happened to be a communion Sunday. And then I served it on Easter. And they said, well, we just had it last week. Why do we need it again? Oh, sigh. But on Palm Sunday, we had a cross in the front of the church. It was wood. It was plain. And I had given everyone in their bulletin a little piece of paper, and I said, during the service, I want you to write down something that you know Jesus died to forgive. And I want you to bring it up and nail it to the cross. And the sound of nails being hammered into a cross is a holy thing. It's a sacred thing. And people were very moved by that. But at the end, there was a teenager who came up to me and handed me her sheet of paper and said, I didn't put anything on the cross. And I said, why not? She said, I never did anything that bad. She said, I sat and thought and thought, I never did anything that bad. Jesus had to die for it. So says a teenager. Oh, my goodness gracious. Now, later in the week, when we took those pieces of paper down after we draped the cross, I undraped it and some fell off. I didn't read them. One fell open. I thought, wow, because I'm a people took it very seriously and put some things that were very serious on those pieces of paper. Then the next Sunday on Easter, what we did, we had the cross wrapped in um, flowers because we hammered a few more nails in and everyone came out to take communion and that day they got, instead of taking, they would hammer their, their sin onto the cross and then have communion to forgive their sin. The next week they would take communion and they got a flower and by the end the cross was just glorified in flowers. It was beautiful. Now, someone, I think Rob told me, he said, very interesting sermon title today, mea culpa. Anybody know what mea culpa means? What does it mean, mea culpa? Forgive me? Okay, that's one way to look at it, but that's not exactly what it means. That's all right. Literally, what do you think it means? Forgive my sins, that's a good guess, but not quite. Mea culpa means, it's Latin, it means through my own fault. Through my own fault. In modern English, it's usually a noun and it talks the acknowledgement of one's error or the acceptance of guilt. Or it's an elaborate apology, especially one that's heartfelt. Now in the Catholic Church, there is something called the Confidior Prayer, where people say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, which means what? Through my own fault, through my own fault, through my worst fault, or my supreme fault. And worshipers describe the ways that they have sinned through their fault, through their fault, through their greatest fault. Now, maybe you don't know mea culpa, maybe you don't say that yourselves, but you've probably used words related to it, because the Latin root culpabilis means worthy of blame, compare means to blame, or culpa means crime, blame, fault, guilt, error, etc. 
Now, maybe he's not used the word mea culpa, but anybody ever said culpability? Or how about culprit? Especially if you're catching the kid who did this, that's the culprit right there. Now, there's also something called the Urban Dictionary. Y'all know what the Urban Dictionary is? Some of you are smiling. If you know the Urban Dictionary, it gives you sort of modern takes on works. And some people say, well, mea culpa isn't it the same as saying my bad. Have you heard my bad being used? It's been used probably 10 or 15 years now. My bad, my bad, my bad. What the Urban Dictionary says about my bad is it's a way of admitting a mistake and apologizing for that mistake without actually apologizing. My bad, oops. Or this is the best definition I've heard. It's paraphrased. I did something bad, and I recognize that I did something bad, but there's nothing that can be done for it now. So there's technically no reason to apologize for that error, so let's just assume that I won't do it again, get over it, and move on with our lives. It's ruder than an apology or sort of a flippant apology, which is not at all what mea culpa is. Mea culpa comes from your heart. It's what the man did in the story that we read who couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven and he beats his breast. It's mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. Now back to Palm Sunday and my girl who said, I've never done anything that bad. She tends to think that God is grading on a curve and she grew up to become a teacher, which is very interesting. No grading on the curve is right person with the best grade in the class, even if it's a lousy grade, gets the A and everybody else sort of curves down from there. I got a 54 on my church history exam, curved out to a B. It's the most ridiculous test I ever took in my life. 40 short essays and a matching section completely in Latin, which you didn't need to know before taking the class, but it's completely in Latin. And everybody sort of went to the dean's office with tor torches and pitchforks and said, oh, and she said she'll curve it. Teacher actually didn't stay at the school after that, but she curved it, and at 54 was a B. But does God grade on the curve? Let me ask you that. Does God grade on the curve? You're sure about that, right? It's like as if the final judgment, and I believe there's going to be a final judgment. It's not a lineup, right? Because if I went to the final judgment, I'm standing there with Adolf Hitler and maybe Stalin, Pol Pot. I'd look pretty good, right? Adolf Hitler personally was responsible through his policies in the Third Reich of exterminating, wiping from the face of the earth, between 11 and 16 million human beings. He wanted to eliminate them so he could have his master race. It wasn't just Jews. Who else did he kill? Who else were part of that, that group? Yell it out. What? Gypsies, mentally ill people, people with any disability. He wanted to wipe them out because they weren't part of the master race. Homosexuals, he wanted to kill them. And you know who else he wanted to kill? Jehovah's Witnesses. The next time they knock on your door, they stood up and said, no, we will not swear allegiance to your crazy thing. And he wanted them to be eliminated off the face of the earth. How many people do you think Joseph Stalin was responsible for killing his own people? Six to nine million. And Pol Pot, who was the Cambodian dictator, through the Khmer Rouge, killed between one and a half to two million Cambodians, which was a quarter of their population. So if I'm in the final judgment, I stand between them, I'm looking really good. I didn't, I've never done anything that bad. I've never done anything nearly that bad. But my luck, I'm not going to be there with Pol Pot and Hitler and Stalin. I'm going to be standing with Mother Teresa, now Saint Teresa, Dr. King, maybe Billy Graham, maybe Miss Betty Stilwell from Falling Waters, West Virginia, or any of the other saints that I've served through the years I've been in ministry. I'll be standing next to them, and then I'm not going to look very good. So I'm saying, thank you, God, that I'm not Adolf Hitler. I'm going to be going, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. The trouble is when you say that, you're kind of doing what um, we're not supposed to do, which is pass judgment, right? Now, when we hear a story like this, you have to identify with somebody in the story, right? And who do we want to identify with in this story? I just read that Hannah read, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Which one do you want to be like? A tax collector, right? Because the other guy is a bad guy, right? It's very clearly there's a bad guy and a good guy. And we want to identify with the one who's being judged instead of the one who's doing the judging. Now, I have said sometimes that I am judging the judgmental and I'm intolerant of the intolerant, which makes me intolerant, right? And judgmental. 
you got to be really careful because as soon as you start to point your finger at the other guy, you become the guy who's pointing his finger back at you. Now, one of the things we have to say about Pharisees, are Pharisees good guys or bad guys in the stories that we read? You're not going to answer that, are you? Because it's like, whatever I say is going to be wrong. And that's true, isn't it? Because the Pharisees, in especially the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of Luke was written more for a universal audience. That's the one where the genealogy of Jesus does not just go back to Abraham and the founding fathers of Israel. It goes back all the way to Adam, son of God. It talks about a universal salvation of, of the world. This is the savior of the whole world, not just the Jewish folks. So there tends to be a way of looking at the Pharisees because of their legalism as they're the bad guys and everybody else is the good guy. But the Pharisees were the ones who observed the law. And what did the man say he does? I tithe. There ain't a pastor on this planet who's going to tell you're a sinner if you're tithing, right? You're going to give 10% of your income to the church? We're going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. He does everything he's supposed to do. That's not a bad thing, is it? Trouble is, he does it while looking down on someone else. We have to be very careful because anti-Semitism is back on the rise in this nation and across the world right now. There is nothing in the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives us any, any right to look down on Jews because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was Jewish. When I hear people saying things about Jews and when I look at the, the, the riots at the Capitol on January 6th, there were people who had T-shirts on that said, six million was not enough. In the name of Jesus Christ, anyone who says anything anti-Semitic is antithetical to the gospel of Christ. I'm telling you that right now. Christian nationalism. Here I am pointing my finger at them. But we're not a Christian nation. To be a Christian is not to be an American. To be an American is not to be a Christian. And the same things that we look down on that come out of Islamic republics are what people want to create in the United States to say we need to be a Christian nation which means we need to subjugate Jews. That is something that is growing in this nation. We've got to say no to that in the name of Jesus Christ as well. But the Pharisee is not the bad guy here in the way he's living his life because he's trying to do what God wants him to do. Except God doesn't want him pointing his finger at somebody else, does he? He wants him instead to say what the other man says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, because we're all sinners in need of grace. We all stand judged before God. Because it's not, it's not a contest between us and anyone else. The bar is Jesus Christ. That's who sets the bar. Now, if I go to the final judgment and I'm with Hitler, I look good. If I go with Mother Teresa, I don't look so good. But it's not, I'm not being compared to Mother Teresa or Hitler. I'm being compared to Jesus Christ. And I have fallen way short of that goal. I read a book this week by a Jesuit priest named Father Greg Boyle. Anybody familiar with Greg Boyle? He started Homeboy Industries in California. He works with gang members. He works with people who are really broken in their lives. He has done over 200 funerals for young men and women who have been shot to death in the street fighting other gangs. He's got a tremendous ministry. And he wrote a book called Tattoos on the Heart, which talks about people who are covered with tattoos. One of the things they do is when he finds out someone's going to prison, he goes to them and he gives them his card and says, when you get out, I want to be the first call that you make. Because so he said, I'll get you a job. We'll get your tattoos removed. Because some of these tattoos are not just tattoos. They're really scary stuff that these guys have on their faces. One man with F.U. written on his face and said, I can't understand why nobody wants to hire me. Father Boyle said, let me get you... When you get out of prison, we'll, we'll get your tattoo removed. And then he got a job, surprisingly enough. He was in his office one day. This is before this young woman was killed. She came into his office. He said, Carmen is a heroin addict, a gang member, street person, occasional prostitute, and a champion hothead. Suddenly, her shame meets mine. For when Carmen walked through the door, I had mistaken her for an interruption. Because he looks at her and he sees prostitute and all these other things. And this is a man who's very busy and he's got this woman coming into his office to complain. And she sat there and cried and said that I have been a horrible person and wasted my life. 
Then he writes something where we stand in all our mistakes and imperfection is holy ground. It is where God has chosen to be intimate with us and not any way but this. And then he asks the question, how much greater is the God we have than the one we think we have? Amen to that. How much greater is the God we have than the one we think we have? Because we look down on people, don't we? If somebody is a prostitute who's dealing drugs, who's used drugs, we're not going to say that that's a good way to live, are we? And he goes into a discussion of what shame is versus guilt. Guilt is being sorrowful for your actions. Shame is being sorrowful for who you are. And we make a lot of people feel shame, don't we, by the way we treat them and exclude them from our fellowships. Reminded me when I was in seminary, I took a course in literacy. And my professor took us to Baltimore. We went door to door and knocked on doors in neighborhoods that probably would have scared a lot of people. And I'm standing there in a skirt and looking very pastoral, very young and pastoral, and knocking on doors of people of different races, of different backgrounds who had nothing. Went into a house in Baltimore City and the floor was dirt. I don't know how you could have a row house with a dirt floor, but they had a dirt, no furniture. I talked to them about their ability to help their children and grandchildren learn how to read, and nobody knew how to read there. It was an eye-opening class. Then my professor said, we got another field trip plan. I'm like, oh, good, where are we going this time? She said, Lorton Prison. Anybody remember Lorton? They tore it down. It was such a bad place. Lorton Prison in Virginia. Went to Lorton Prison at the maximum security facility with my skirt on, looking like a little pastor girl. And I met with a group of men who were serving life sentences without the possibility of parole, which meant they had to kill at least one other human being to be in that program. These were men who were never going to get out of jail ever. They were going to spend their lives in this horrible place or wherever they got moved to when Lorton was torn down. We went to see them because they had learned to read in prison, knowing they would never get out. They learned to read. You know why they learned to read? So that they could teach other prisoners who were going to be released how to read so that when they got out, they could get a job. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems a little strange. If you're never going to get out, you got nothing to lose, right? What do you got to gain by doing this? Nothing, because they're not going to get out anyway. We sat there and we talked to these men. I think they were all like nine or ten feet tall. We're sitting there sort of shaking in our little boots at these guys. Tattoos like you would never believe. I never knew that they had words like that. They could be tattooed on your face. We said, why would you do this? Why would you do this? Why in the world would you do this? If you're not going to get out, why are you going to take your time and learn how to read to teach somebody else to read? You know what they said? Let me get your guess on what they said. Maybe you have any idea what they would say to that? They said, because when you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, when you know what God has done for you, you will do anything to give back to God. And it about knocked me off my seat. I'm telling you that right now. Because these were men that you didn't expect those words to come out of their mouth. And we said, how did you find out about Jesus Christ? And they found out about Jesus Christ from their prison chap, and they started to talk about him, tears flowing down their faces, about how this man had convince them of the love of God and the grace of God. And he was going to come in and meet with us later. And he finally came in. I was expecting Superman to walk through the door. I was expecting tall, flowing hair, lovely, you know, beautiful man. In walks a priest who's like four foot nine, as wide as he was tall, bald, with a straggly beard, and his elbows popping through his sweater. And he walked in, and those men looked at him with such love in their eyes such love in their hearts for him because he had made the love of God real to these men that nobody else cared about in the world. Nobody cared about them. They hadn't been visited by family. They had been forgotten about by their community. Like the woman that Pastor Boyle or Father Boyle said came in and he had mistaken her for an interruption. And she came to tell him she had hit the wall and that there was nothing left for her. And he saw in her shame the love that God had for her and he convinced her of that. Now let's look again at our call to worship this morning from the psalm. What does it say about the place of God, the house of God? How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs and he faints for the course of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home in the swallow a nest for herself where it may, she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Imagine what it would be like to walk into a church if you're a prostitute. Imagine what it's like to walk into the church if you don't fit the stereotype of what a good Christian looks like. 
imagine if you're the tax collector instead of the Pharisee. Now, I said the Pharisee were really, there were people who were trying hard. You know what tax collectors were? They were Jews too. They were Jews who had colluded with Rome and took advantage of their own people. They cheated and they stole from others. Nobody liked a tax collector. Well, who was the one that went home made righteous before God? Who was the one who justified before God? Justified, atoned with God was the one who went to God, not on his righteousness, but on his knees, and he beat his breast, and he said, have mercy on me, a sinner. When was the last time we prayed a confessional prayer? Was it the last time we had communion here? Because we always have prayer and confession before we have the words of assurance of pardon before we take communion. What a different world we live in every day if every one of us here began our day praying. God have mercy on me, a sinner. We went through the sins. My husband was a good Baptist boy. I went to his church whenever I went to Princeton, West Virginia, and met with his pastor, whose sermons were longer than our whole service, by the way. And he used to say all the time, now don't tell me you don't know when you're sinning. How many of you really don't know when you're sinning? When something's come out of your mouth that's too hard for somebody else, or when you've mistaken... Someone told me yesterday about a lovely little card that said something about mistaking a prayer concern and gossip, because there's a fine line between that, isn't there, sometimes? Or, you know, in the South, what you say when you're going to gossip about somebody, you have to follow with lesser heart. Lesser heart, then it's okay, right? But if we started our day saying, God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner, and I need to repent, and I need to open my heart to you to be made whole, we would live in a very, very different world. Father Boyle puts it this way in his book, how can we seek a compassion that can stand in awe at what people have to carry rather than stand in judgment of how they carry it? Read that again. How can we seek a compassion that can stand in awe at what people have to carry rather than stand in judgment of how they carry it? It's a hard little parable here this morning, isn't it, that Jesus tells people. Pharisee and a tax collector go into the temple to pray. One knows he's done right in God's eyes and says, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like the other people in the world. I thank you I'm not like him. I thank you I'm not like her. I think I'm not like them. But the other one says, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. And he's the one that goes home justified. Now, my girl Annette, was the one who said, I would have written something down, but I'd never done anything that bad. I teased her about that when I did her wedding. When her first child was born, her kids are now, I think, probably in middle school, if not high school, her oldest. I was there the day her first son was born. She was in crisis. Her son was born on Christmas Eve, and they called me and said, can you go to the hospital? I mistook that for an interruption. I got there, though. She was unconscious. Her husband was not allowed in to see her. Her mother was not allowed in to see her because she was in crisis after giving birth. She said she opened her eyes and looked at me and thought, it's an angel and it looks just like Pastor Terry. I teased her for years about it. I'm sorry you've never done any, you're not a sinner. And she said, now I could fill reams of pain. I could cover that whole cross with my sins. The things I've done that Christ died to forgive. That's the key, isn't it? To look at what Christ died to forgive you for. But don't live in your shame. Don't live in your guilt. Let it go. Let God in your life, and you will be made whole in a new way. After we hung those sins on the cross, we sang one of my favorite sins, my favorite sins, my favorite hymns. <laughs> my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Trouble is, we, like Claire, sins at the foot of the cross, don't we? And then we pick them up and put them back on and wear them home. I'm going to ask you to leave your sin with God because God can handle it. That's why Christ came. That's how much God loves you that God sent Jesus Christ to bear your sin so you don't have to. We just have to learn to stop pointing fingers at other people, comparing ourselves to them. Because when you do that, you're going to lose. Thank you, choir, for singing that song this morning. I asked Lambert if he knew that one and he got it and the choir learned it. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise for it was grace that bought my liberty 
I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I will forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. That is who God is in Jesus Christ. That is who God is in Jesus Christ. That is who God is in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen, amen, amen. I invite you now to stand.